Okay, if we could turn, please, to Ezekiel once again, and we're going to read chapter 1, verses 1 through 14, and then we will just read from the end of verse 28, again, just to remind us of the overall context of what we're seeing. So beginning in verse 1, and we're going to be thinking about particularly the uh, four living creatures today, uh, the vision that uh, he was given. Uh, he saw a throne chariot. Uh, we won't get to the whole of the throne chariot that he saw, but we're going to at least begin by looking at the details of these four living creatures. So beginning in verse 1, it, be, it reads this way. Now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river of Kibar, that the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. In the fifth day of the month, which was the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity, the word of the Lord came expressly unto Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Kibar, and the hand of the Lord was there upon him. And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud, and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it. And out of the midst thereof, as the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire, also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man, and every one had four faces, and every one had four wings. And their feet were straight feet, and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot, and they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. And they had the hands of a man under their wings, on their four sides, and they four had their faces and their wings. Their wings were joined one to another. They turned not when they went, and they went every one straight forward. As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man, and the face of a lion on the right side, and they four had the face of an ox on the left side. They four also had the face of an eagle. Thus were their faces and their wings were stretched upward. Two wings of every one were joined one to another, and two covered their bodies. And they went every one straightway forward, whither the spirit was to go, they went, and they turned not when they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, and like the appearance of lamps, it went up and down among the living creatures, and the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning. And the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. And then we'll just read the last kind of phrase in verse 28, and it says, uh, uh, well, second to last, it says, this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face and I heard a voice of one that spake. And again, God will indeed bless that reading of his precious word to us this morning. So the beginning of Ezekiel's ministry, he is given, as we've seen here, this vision and it's, he, he describes it, summarizes it, that what he had actually seen was the likeness of the glory of the Lord, the glory of Yahweh. So he, he got a glimpse, if you like, of the glory of God. And it, it put him on his face. Uh, he fell on his face like a dead man. Just like John on the Isle of Patmos when he saw a vision of the glorified Lord Jesus Christ, he also fell on his face like a dead man. Just like Saul of Tarsus, when he saw a vision of the glorified Lord Jesus, he also bit the dust and fell on his face uh, in his presence. And so what we would say is this, that a vision of the glory of God will certainly impact a man's life. It, it will certainly bring him uh, to realize that he's just dust in the presence of a God who is significantly wonderful and holy and righteous and all these things. And so uh, there's a song we often sing. It talks about uh, uh, turning to the Lord Jesus, looking uh, full in his wonderful 
face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And so one of the things we'll find is that when people saw the glory of God, they just couldn't go back to living normal lives afterwards. It really affected them uh, deeply. And of course it would, if we saw a glimpse of the glory of God, it would change everything. So I just want to kind of focus a little bit, just as we start on the idea of what the glory of God is, or how it affected men, uh, just because this is what this chapter is about. It's He saw visions of the glory of the Lord, uh, the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And of course, it was going to affect him for, for the next 20 years of his prophetic ministry. This incident is going to be always at the back of his mind, what he saw at the very beginning of his ministry. But I'm thinking of different scriptures that would remind us of the glory of God. So let's go to John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 14. Here's John, now an old man writing this reminiscence of what he witnessed that changed his life so dramatically that took him from a successful fishing business to being an apostle of the Lord Jesus. And one of the things that he says is, verse 14, John chapter 1, the word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. And then this little phrase, we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. It's almost like he's saying is, once you've seen that, everything changes. We talk about a game changer. It changed the whole course of this man's life. He beheld his glory. Uh, Peter would say a similar thing, wouldn't he, in Second Peter 1, 16. We won't turn there. We know it well. Peter would say, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Again, his life was forever changed by what he glimpsed of the majesty, the glory of the eternal Son of God. Look at Acts chapter 7. Acts 7, great scripture. Verse 2, we read this amazing statement. He said, men, brethren, and fathers, hearken, the God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran. There is a legend, I don't know how true it is, but uh, the legend was that, that Abraham and his family certainly were idolaters before they saw the glory of God. Scripture tells us that. But there is a suggestion that they were actually idol makers in Babylon. And if that's true, <laughs> once he saw this glimpse of the glory of the Lord, and again, this is how the legend goes, he destroyed all the idols except one. And when his father came in and said, who did that? He said, ask the idol he saw it, he'll tell you. And so it was kind of the idea that he was done with idolatry and he left all that behind. Now, again, how true that is, I have no idea, but it's just an interesting story. What we do know is that he could no longer live with the tackiness of the idols of Ur the Chaldees when he had seen the glory of the Lord. He left it all behind and he went out, not even knowing where he was going, but he had seen something that captivated his heart the very same chapter, chapter 7, verse 55, it talks about Stephen, the one who's just told us in this sermon about the God of glory appearing to Abraham. And what does he see? It says, but he, 755, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Amazing. And of course, he was able to die well, having seen that glimpse of the glory of God. So I'm just saying that it's just when a man sees this glimpse of the glory of God, it's what we call a life-changing event. And it certainly changed the life of the apostles, changed the life of Abraham, uh, changed the life of Stephen, uh, and would always do that. So some of the common themes of men who saw the glory of God. Firstly, they were aware of their own sinfulness and uncleanness. Thinking when Isaiah saw a glimpse, uh, John 12 tells us that Isaiah spake of him when he saw his glory, <laughs> speaking of the Lord Jesus. I think it's uh, John 12, 41. And it, 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 what, what happened to Isaiah when he got that glimpse? He's, he, he'd been pronouncing woes on everybody in the previous chapter. 
chapter 5 of Isaiah, but in chapter 6, he's no longer pronouncing woes on anybody else. He says, woe is me. See, when you get a glimpse of the glory of the Lord, it reveals our own sinfulness and uncleanness. They couldn't forget or neglect the heavenly vision. Paul would say, I was not negligent <laughs> uh, to uh, f- forget that the vision that he saw, the heavenly vision. It led them to prostration, humbled in the dust, in the divine presence. And again, we we see that with Ezekiel. We see it with John. We see it with Paul or Saul of Tarsus. It resulted in service. Isaiah said, after he saw that vision, here am I, send me. Saul said, Lord, what will you have me to do? Abraham went out not knowing where he was going. Ezekiel would begin a 20-plus year ministry of speaking for God. And so it really resulted in service. What, what will you have me to do? And it blinded them from the allurements of the world. Just as the eyes of Abraham were turned away from the idols, they just looked so tacky when he had seen this glimpse of the glory of God. And so it's good just to kind of think about this. Um, I love this thought that Moses, who had seen so very much, if you look at Ex- Exodus 33, I mean, he'd seen more than the average person of the greatness of God, and yet he's not satisfied. And he he, he makes a, a an amazing statement in Exodus 33, verse 18. He said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. That What a wonderful request, huh? Show me your glory. And it would be good for us to pray, uh, especially as we read the scriptures, to pray that the Lord would show us something of the glory of the Son of God, as we read on the pages of Scripture. Also, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, which again, I think, verifies this statement that we just made, that as we read the Word of God, we want to be praying like Moses, show me your glory, give me a glimpse of your glory, a life-changing glimpse of your glory. It says in chapter 318 of Second Corinthians, but we all with open face, beholding as in a glass or a mirror, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. And I think the thought here is this, that as we look into the Scriptures, see the glory of Christ, and are captivated by it, it'll be as life-changing for us as it was for these individuals we've been speaking about. And we will be changed into the same image, the very image of Christ. That's God's ultimate plan. We were made to be image bearers. That was the whole point of the creation. As we gaze on the one who was that perfect man, who also had the full glory of God in him, as we gaze on him, there's a transforming effect. And we're changed from, from uh, to the same image from glory to glory, even by the Spirit of the Lord. And of course, that's the work of the Spirit, isn't it? He wants to make us like Christ. He wants us to, he wants this world to get a glimpse of the glory of the Son of God. And to, to get that glimpse, it would be seeing Christ in our lives, that great song, Christ liveth in me, Christ liveth in me. Oh, what a salvation this Christ liveth in me. That's the, the prayer. So what do we mean? by the glory of God. Obviously, this chapter is a description of what he saw. He saw the likeness of the glory of the Lord. How do we begin to describe the glory of God? Evidently, Ezekiel has some difficulty in chapter 1 in describing what he saw because he uses the term likeness and like 16 times, and he uses the phrase the appearance of 15 times. So as he's trying to get around what he saw and describe it to us, he says, well, it was like this. It it appeared to be like this. In other words, he's trying to, how do you define something like this that, you know, has not been seen rarely by men? And here he's trying to describe something. And it's obvious that there's some difficulties. That's why he uses the term likeness and like. By the way, the theme glory is a great theme in scripture. You'll find the word glory 371 times in the King James Bible. And it's good if you read through the Bible every year. I love to 
try and pick a theme as I go through each year to just look for that theme. And one year I did the glory of God and I made a note and reference to every time I saw the glory of God in scripture, it was really quite an amazing study. So I want to just try and grasp what do we mean by glory? Let's begin with the first mention. It's always a good way to understand a truth uh, by looking how was it used the very first time it was used because often it carries that idea throughout the text of scripture, how it's used in the first mention. So we have to go back to Genesis 31 and verse one. This is what it says. And he heard the words of Laban's sons saying, Jacob hath taken away all that was our father's and of that which was our father's hath he gotten all this glory. And so what does that tell us? Now, the actual word means weight. Now, not in a negative sense, you know, like in our culture, uh, I need to lose weight. So weight is always seen as a negative thing. But in, in this culture, weight was seen as a great thing, and always in a good sense, something like wealth, prestige, splendor, honor, that kind of idea. And so in the ancient world, how was a person's wealth, prestige measured? It wasn't that he had a new BMW in his driveway. It wasn't that he, you know, had his own private yacht and a condo in Florida and all this other stuff. A person's, uh, I suppose, prestige was measured by how many cattle he had, how many head of cattle. And so in this story... Jacob, of course, working seven years and then another seven years. And, of course, the Lord had prospered, prospered Jacob. And so as the sons of Laban look on, they say, this man has, has taken away our father, all that our father has and have gotten all his glory. And so in other words, the one who's now looking prestigious is no longer Laban. It's Jacob. Following on that idea... Let's look at Genesis 45 in verse 13. This is a, a fabulous verse, and one I think, again, should be the object of much prayer as we gather to remember the, the Savior on the Lord's Day. Uh, this is uh, Joseph, and he's sending his brothers back to let his father know that he's alive. And this is what he says, You shall tell my father of all my glory, in Egypt and of all that you have seen and you shall haste and bring down my father hither. So I wonder what his brothers would have told their father. What would his message be? Well, I suggest that what it would be is, wow, you should see Joseph now. The way he dresses the way he goes around this transportation on the second chariot, you know, in the whole kingdom, uh, the the authority, the so again, it's 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 his prestige, it's his honor, it's it's the weightiness of all that belongs to him. Now, I want us to go back to that Exodus thirty three passage because I want to suggest you the simplest definition I've ever come across, and you probably heard me say this before, but that's okay. Repetition is how we learn. But I believe that the best definition I've ever come across in terms of glory is that which makes someone or something look good. And so when he uh, prays, uh, Moses, show me the, your glory, notice how the Lord answers. Verse 19, he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. Now, he says a lot of other things, but for our purposes, all my goodness will pass before thee. In answer to the prayer, show me your glory. What did he show him? He caused all his goodness. Because if glory means that which makes a person look good, God revealed all his goodness to Moses. And he saw that. By the way, I think we have been looking at his glory in our lives because one of our themes often in our lives is looking at the goodness of God and how good he's been to us. And we say, wow, what a, what a God he is, that he's been so good to us. How good 
is the God we adore, our faithful, unchangeable friend, right? So the goodness of God. So just to, to think about this idea of glory, look at John 17, just a beautiful scripture. John 17 and verse 4, the Lord Jesus in what is often called his high priestly prayer when he's speaking to his father. And he says this in verse 4, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And I think a good way of thinking of that is that everything the Lord Jesus did made the Father look good. He went about doing good, right? Showing the goodness of the Father. He he only said those words the Father gave him to speak. He did those things the Father told him to do. And everything he did made the Father look good. And by the way, nothing makes the Father look good more than the love of the cross. Uh, my theme in the Bahamas, I preached uh, all the messages on this theme of the glory of the cross, because nothing makes God look good more than the cross. It shows off his attributes in, in absolute beauty and significance, doesn't it? His holiness, his righteousness, his love, his mercy, all the attributes of God are on display at the cross. Uh, and so, just to kind of emphasize it a little bit further, just some other references that I think are significant um, in this little study on the glory of God, because that's what we're really thinking about. Ezekiel got a glimpse of the glory of God. First Corinthians 11, this is why I believe the, the veiling of women in the assembly is so important. People often say, oh, I wish you would preach something different. You know, don't just drop that head covering thing. And I say, if you tell me the glory of God is insignificant, I'll stop speaking on 1 Corinthians 11. And notice eleven seven. it says, for a man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God. And notice this, the woman is the glory of the man. Kind of interesting, I, my wife was down with me in the Bahamas, and I don't know why, but they seem to pay more attention when I speak when my wife is there. <laughs> I think it just said there must be something about this guy to have a, a wife like that. She makes me look really good, and I'm very thankful for that. So that which makes someone or something look good. The woman is the glory of the man. Best thing ever came out of man was the woman. Just a few other references, and we're, we're going to go back to Ezekiel now because we want to just keep this theme going just for a bit more, this idea of the glory of God. Ezekiel 20, verse 6, we read this stunning scripture, really. It says, In the day that I lifted up mine hand unto them to bring them forth of the land of Egypt into a land that I had espied for them, flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of of all lands. Wow, isn't that interesting? We often say, well, you know, kind of Quebec or Nova Scotia. I mean, that's the glory of all lands or M Missouri or wherever, but it isn't. This little strip of real estate that God gave to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, no piece of real estate will make God look good more than that piece of real estate. It's the glory of all lands. It's really going to reveal something of his glory. Isaiah, the prophet, chapter 46. Isaiah 46, verse 13. Read something else. It says, And I bring near my righteousness, it shall not be far off, and my salvation shall not tarry, and I will place salvation in Zion for Israel my glory. Again, I don't think there's any nation that is going to make God look good more than Israel. Well, one thing, his patience and long-suffering with that nation, you read the Old Testament, you're just amazed that he still has any purposes for that nation. It, it, it reveals his patience in a marvelous way. Israel, my glory. Again, while we're in Isaiah, just look at chapter 42. One of the things that's very important to, to grasp, and that is this, Isaiah 42 eight. I am the Lord, that is my name, and notice this, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. 
God is jealous of his glory. By the way, another kind of affirmation of the deity of Christ, that he would say to the Father, Father, glorify me with the glory I had with thee before the world was. When he even talks about uh, in John 12, Father, glorify me. The hours come the Son of Man should be glorified. And he says, I have glorified it, I'll glorify it again. And so just the idea of this, that the very fact that God is jealous of his glory, he won't give it to another, but he'll give it to his Son, tells us that the Son must be co-equal with the Father in part of what we call the triunity of God. So many emphases, emphasize this point. The very, uh, look at First um, Chronicles chapter 22 in verse 5. Just want us to see something here. It says, David said, Solomon, my son, is young and tender, and the house that is to be builded for the Lord must be exceeding magnificent of fame and of glory throughout all countries. In other words, if, if ever there was a house that was built that was designed to show off the glory of God, it was Solomon's temple. This house must be exceeding magnificent. It's designed to reveal something of the glory of God. Psalm 29, this is our last reference on this little theme of the glory of God, Psalm 29. And verse 9, read this, it says, The voice of the Lord maketh the hinds to carve, and discovereth the for forests. And then just listen to this phrase. And in his temple doth everyone speak of his glory. When we come to the house of God, in the New Testament context is the church, we would say this, that what we want to do, everything we do, everything we say, is to speak of his glory, is to magnify him, to make him look good, to make him look look, look great, because he is great. And so just again, these kind of little definitions, that which makes someone or some, someone look good, that's a simple definition, but I find it very helpful. Let, let me give you some of the other definitions about the glory of God. The light and splendor which belongs to God. And so certainly we can see something of that when the Lord Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, the light and splendor that belongs to God was, was as it were, shone through. Uh, the outshining of his excellence, another way of describing his glory. So the Shekinah glory, we often talk about that phrase and again, just seeing something of the outshining of his excellence. Beauty, majesty, splendor, wealth, power, dignity of character, all of them are kind of words that have been used to try and describe what Ezekiel saw. And again, he's struggling to describe what he's seeing, but it is this glorious theme of the glory of God. So just interesting and aside too, is that um, angelic beings, we're going to look at the, the cherubim in a moment, but one of the things that they do and the seraphim do as well is that they usually use their wings to cover their glory in the presence of his glory. When we look at Lucifer, and we'll see him in this book, Ezekiel 28, 14, he was the anointed cherub that covereth. In other words, he should have been covering his glory in the presence of his glory. But at some point, because people commented on his beauty, did he unfurl his glory in the presence of his glory? Can't be dogmatic about it, but it would seem to me that that's a big issue uh, that is being revealed there, that the angelic realms, and not just the angelic realms, even in the assembly of God, all competing glories, the woman's long hair, which is her personal glory, she takes a veil to cover that so that the only glory seen in the assembly is God, uh, the man with uncovered head, which is the glory of God. So just to remind ourselves that as he tries to describe this scene, as we've already said, 16 times he uses like and likeness, uh, 15 times the appearance of. 
why it's so difficult is if you if you and I just this is a homework assignment, but if you go to your computer after this, and if you do a, a look on Google or whatever uh, browser you use, and just type in Ezekiel's vision in chapter one, and see how many different kind of pictures you'll get of people trying to somehow get a hold of this vision and and portray it correctly very difficult they're they're all different in because it's it's not an easy thing how do you begin to describe the glory of god how do you begin to describe these these cherubim the heavenly chariot the throne to people who have no conception really of what you're talk, speaking of and so that's why he uses these terms of like and likeness so frequently so let's do a little outline of chapter one in verses one through three we're going to start with the background and introduction. And then verses 4 through 14, the vision of the four cherubim. So we're going to, that's where we're going to focus today. Verse 15 through 25 is the vision of the throne chariot. So above the cherubim, and they're called the attendant wheels, then we have this firmament. And then the final section, verse 26 through 28, is the vision of the divine throne seated on top of that firmament. So this is the, the the outline of this particular vision. So by the by way of background and introduction, it says it came to pass in the thirtieth year. And again, we're all I think most commentators are in agreement that it's of Ezekiel's life when in better days and under normal circumstances, the time would be that he would commence his service in the temple because he's a priest. And we know from numbers, at least when it came to the tabernacle, uh, service began, Numbers chapter 4, verse 3. Uh, we read this little statement that uh, helps us to understand when these men began their actual service. From 30 years old and upward, even until 50 years old, all that enter into the host to do the work in the tabernacle of the congregation. Now, what's interesting is that although they began their work at 30, when we get to First Chronicles, it seems that they may have begun their preparation at 20. So it's almost like 10 years of preparation before you actually begin to minister. Now, let me just find that scripture. I think it's First Chronicles 23. And... Verse 24, I got my things correctly. It says, uh, These were the sons of Levi after the house of their fathers, even the chief of the fathers, as they were counted by number of names by their poles that did the work for the service of the house of the Lord from the age of 20 years and upwards. So it seems that there was kind of almost like a 10 year apprenticeship, right? And then 30, you began to actually enter into fully qualified ministry as a priest. Now, if that's true, when he was taken captive at 25 years of age, it was interrupting his preparation. And I'm sure he felt really disappointed. You know, this is your life's work. You're, you're from this tribe, this unique tribe that has this privilege of serving in the, the house of God. And here he is five years into his training, and suddenly he's taken captive into Babylon, and it seems like all his hopes are dashed. He's miles away from the temple in Jerusalem, the place of his ministry. However, it's interesting that the priestly background of Ezekiel made him a very suitable recipient of these divine revelations, because a lot of what Ezekiel is about is the temple. It's about the glory leaving the temple, and it's about a new temple that will be built for a restored Israel of which the glory will return. So certainly a man who's been already training, already thinking about activity in the house of God, how ideal he is for such a role that God would call him for. And so we notice it says it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river of Kibar, that the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. Now, what we want to say is this, that to see the heavens opened in Scripture 
is a very rare event. Very rare. Very few times that it's mentioned that an individual saw the heavens opened. So I want to talk about the, the just the few references that there are. And so again, he didn't get to go into the temple. But boy, what did he get to see? <laughs> he got to see the heavens opened. <laughs> Wow, what a privilege. God has a way of compensating, doesn't he? This man probably frustrated that he didn't get to complete his training so he could begin to minister as a priest. And yet the Lord more than compensated by giving him a vision of heaven opened. So let's just look at the references. There are so few of them, it won't take as long. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 3. Matthew, chapter 3. And verse 16 read this and jesus when he was baptized went up straightway out of the water and lo the heavens were opened unto him and he saw the spirit of god descending like a dove and lighting upon him so when jesus is 30 years of age and about to begin his ministry the heavens open and of course the spirit comes upon him i've already been in act 7 Twice this morning, we're going to go back there again. Acts chapter 7, verse 56, very next to the verse we looked at. Acts 7, verse 56, we read this reference and it says, And said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Wow, what a privilege for Stephen. Again, one of the few individuals in Scripture that actually saw the heaven opened. And what does he see? He says, the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And then, still in the book of Acts, chapter 10, and verse 11. Another time when the heavens were open, it says, speaking of Peter, verse 10, he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth so he gets this vision of this net with all these creatures which he thought were unclean god is now cleansing them showing that by inference, the gospel can now come to the Gentile world in a marvelous way. So again, very significant heavens opened event. And then Revelation chapter 19, the last reference, when it says somebody saw heaven opened, it's John the Apostle, 1911, I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he to judge and make war. So Ezekiel is the only prophet enabled by God to look into the throne room of the Almighty, to have seen the heavens opened. Again, what a, what a privilege for this man that he gets to see this. And he says he saw the heavens opened, and I saw visions of God. Wow, what a privilege to see what he saw. Of course, there are two other references to heaven opened uh, that we want to mention in Scripture. We won't turn to them, but you'll know them well. In Genesis 7, verse 11, it says the heavens opened, <laughs> but it was for a huge flood to judge sin on the earth. And then the other one, is not so much judgment, but one of blessing. And it's a promise, and it's in Malachi 3.10. And the promise is that if they would get serious about their responsibilities in the house of God, would he not open heaven and send down a blessing to them? So just that's the full complement of heaven opened. Very, very interesting uh, to think about this. Notice verse 2, it says, In the fifth day of the month, which was the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity. So, 25 years of age, he's taken captive. Five years he's been in captivity. Now he gets this vision connected with King Jehoiakim's 
captivity. And again, what a tragedy that in a sense, the nation are back in the land that Abraham was called out of. Remember how he was called out of the land of Ur of the Chaldees by a vision of the glory of God. Now they're back in Babylon again, in that Chaldean region once again. And once again, a man gets a vision of the glory of God. Interesting. And yet how tragic that the nation found themselves back there after 1,300 years. And why did they find themselves back here? Because they exchanged the glory of God for a lie. And they actually worshipped the created thing rather than the creator. They actually went back to idolatry of the worst kind. Tells us, verse 3, the word of the Lord came expressly unto Ezekiel the priest. No question mark about this, that he, the word of the Lord came to him with such clarity. Uh, and that phrase expressly means that there's no there's nothing doubtful about this. Every time he saw these visions, it was very, very clear, very expressly seen by our man Ezekiel. And he tells us uh, the word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel the priest. That's why we know he was a priest, because it tells us very directly He's the son of Buzi. Now, that word Buzi, kind of, we already said Ezekiel means God strengthens, and he's going to need God's strength for his ministry. But Buzi means my contempt. Now, we don't know the circumstances, but it's kind of a sad name to give somebody my contempt. And maybe it's a foreshadowing of what Ezekiel was going to taste. Because even though he's going to speak for God, He's going to be treated by many of his hearers with contempt. Uh, the idea of contempt is dislike, lack of respect, and certainly his brethren who would show a lot of dislike and a lot of disrespect to the servant of God. And so maybe it's just a foreshadowing of what he would experience personally. He does say, though, that not only did the word of the Lord come expressly to him, but he also says where it took place in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Kiba. And then he says this lovely statement, the hand of the Lord was there upon him. Oh, what a wonderful statement that is. Now, let me just show you what it means to have God's hand upon your life. Uh, here's just one example. We could look at a lot of scriptures. In fact, I believe up to 13 times in this um prophecy we're going to read that the word of god came to him and the hand of the lord was upon him so it's a very great theme but in the book of acts chapter 11 verse 21 a lovely statement about the saints of god uh, and what they were experiencing it says and the hand of the lord this is acts 11 21 the hand of the lord was there was with them and a great number believed and turned to the lord and so what we would say is this, Ezekiel's service was characterized by the hand of the Lord being upon him, which would refer to God's enablement, and the word of the Lord coming to him, which would speak of God's enlightenment. Okay, and we see this in this simple verse 3. Word of Lord came expressly to Ezekiel the priest. That's God's enlightenment. God is a revealer. He's revealing himself, and he's revealing himself to Ezekiel. And so he's getting enlightenment from God, God's enlightenment. And then he's got to deliver this message of what he's seen. The hand of the Lord was there upon him, God's enablement. And how we need to pray that in our assemblies, that men who speak the word of God, have not only God's enlightenment, they've got good understanding of the text of Scripture, but they know God's enablement, that it would be evident that the hand of the Lord was upon them as they preach the word of the Lord. And we need to pray for that, because just like Ezekiel, we're seeking to proclaim the word to a re our own rebellious generation. Remember last week we said that, that he's, his job is to speak to a bunch of rebels, a rebellious house. And it's not easy to proclaim a message to people who are rebellious in nature. We need a clear message from God 
the word of the Lord coming to us, and we need his enablement, the hand of the Lord to be upon us to be able to do this. Kind of interesting that um, there's a big thing um, in a lot of Christendom about ordination and the laying on of hands of men. But I love what Harry Ironside says in co commenting on Ezekiel. He talks about a man who's got the hand of the Lord upon him. And this is what he says. Christ, the Son of God, hath sent me through the midnight lands, in other words, through the dark places of the world, mind the mighty ordination of the pierced hands. Oh, what a wonderful thing to have the hand of the Lord upon you, to be ordained of God to minister in holy things and know the hand of God upon you. Now, the river Kibar, which is where these visions occur, was known uh, to the Babylonians as the Grand Canal. And we said just a suggestion that possibly the Israelites were involved in the process of digging that canal, just as they were involved in hard labor in Egypt. But the, the river Kibar, uh, it flowed southeast uh, from the river Euphrates at Babylon. And the the term uh, Kibar just simply means far away. Kind of interesting. These people are far away from home. And they're subject to hard labor in a difficult place because the way of the transgressor is hard. Because when we get involved in sin and rebellion, it takes us far away from where we should be. And it does bring hardship, right? The way of the transgressor is always hard. So that's kind of an interesting insight. So now, verse 4, we want to think about what he saw. So he says, And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof as the color of amber out of the midst of the fire. So let me just give you kind of the vision as a whole. He saw this violent electrical storm coming from the north. As he got a closer view, within that storm, he observed two major objects. He saw these four living creatures with their attending wheels, and then he saw one like a man enthroned upon an expanse stretching over the heads of the four living creatures. We might say what he saw was a man riding in triumph through the heavens on his throne chariot. That's what he saw. That's the big picture. But now we get to the 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 actual details and we're going to notice some of the, the amazing attributes of god that are revealed in this vision we're going to see something of divine omnipotence and om omnipresence and omniscience all of these attributes we're going to see as we see this vision but it says i looked and behold and it gives us the direction of the chariot a whirlwind coming out of the north now i want to just kind of talk about this now this is very relevant to right now because we're in a tornado country. In fact, they're suggesting that there's a strong possibility of tornado activity later on today for us. A um, place that I've preached before, a place called Greenfield, Iowa, got a direct hit by a tornado. Um, just um, I was watching some drone footage of it. There's an assembly. Thankfully, the building wasn't damaged and the homes of the saints weren't, but a lot of the city was devastated by this tornado. So the idea is this, when, when you see a whirlwind coming, usually it means devastation and destruction. It's not something, unless you're one of these crazy storm chasers, you look forward to seeing, right? They're very frighteningly powerful. So that's what he's seeing. Speaks of God's judgment coming out of the north, with the attending devastation and destruction. So let's just look at a, a couple of references in a contemporary prophet, Jeremiah, where we get this same idea of this whirlwind judgment. Jeremiah 23, we're going to look at three references in Jeremiah 23, verse 19. Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord is gone forth in fury. Even a grievous whirlwind, it shall fall grievously upon the head of the wicked. So really, the idea is that behind this whirlwind, 
God is in it. We're going to see that in Ezekiel's vision too. God is the one who is behind this destruction that is coming on the nation of Judah because of their wickedness. And so he's riding, as it were, in the whirlwind. But it's coming uh, towards them, a grievous whirlwind. Chapter 25, verse 32, again in Jeremiah Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation, and a great whirlwind shall be raised up from the coast of the earth. And of course, not only did Babylon take Judah into captivity, but it destroyed, they destroyed several nations along the way. So again, that idea, great whirlwind. One more reference, chapter 30 of Jeremiah and verse 23. 30 verse 23, Behold, the whirlwind of the Lord goeth forth with fury, a continuing whirlwind, it shall fall with pain upon the head of the wicked. Okay. So we're getting a picture here, right? This is speaking of divine judgment. Uh, the, in fact, God is in the whirlwind. God is bringing that destruction. Now, of course, obviously, what we're really talking about is the Babylonian invasion, which ultimately is coming from God. Although Ezekiel himself is already among the captives, he's going to prophesy of those that remain in Jerusalem and their false hope that everything was going to go well for them. And this message is this. No, judgment is coming. And it's going to come from the north. Now, interestingly, Babylon is directly east of Israel. But because between, if you come in a direct straight line, you've got to go through a lot of desert. So that would not be the route they would take. They would normally go up northeast and then come down from the north directly through Lebanon into the land. And that's exactly how Israel's en enemies traditionally came in from that northern approach. So a storm was covenant coming and the government of God had decreed it. The lesson is clear. The movements of armies and nations are under the control of the throne of God. By the way, that's good for us to know because right now we're living in days of a lot of saber rattling. Uh, you hear you know, different nations, the UK telling people to get emergency supplies because war is imminent. That's amazing that they would tell that to people in the UK. All that's going on, you know, this kind of Ukraine thing is getting a lot bigger than just Ukraine. And so, you know, we're, we're seeing that kind of thing. And just to recognize that God ultimately is working out all of these historical events for his own purposes. He's on the throne. He's in control. And it's good. It kind of gives you rest in your spirit. God is in control. He knows what he's doing. We can rest in that. So what does he see? So he, he tells us, I look, behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself. So when we think of this, there, there's several things involved here. There's wind, there's cloud, there's fire, all the symbols of God's glory and God's presence. Uh, we, we want to look at some of those things. But I want to just think about this fire enfolding itself. The idea is this, that it's feeding on itself. It's self-sustaining. What does that remind you of? Is there any fire that's self-sustaining that we think about when we get a revelation of God? Well, we go back to the book of Exodus, don't we? And that burning bush, remember? It didn't need any more fuel. It was like a self-sustaining fire. And that's the picture that there's this fire that's, that, that is just uh, uh, coming, uh, feeding on itself, self-sustaining enfolding itself a great cloud let's just look at again these symbols of of god's presence god's glory uh, exodus 24 we just look at a few of them because we have to interpret these symbols from scripture that we're seeing 24 17 the sight of the glory of the lord was like devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of israel so when god came down at sinai what was it like? What was the sight of the glory of the Lord like? Devouring fire on the top. Psalm 18, wonderful uh, descriptive psalm of the glory of God. Psalm 18 from verse 8. Oops. 
down to verse 13. It says, There went up smoke out of his nostrils, and fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down. Darkness was under his feet, and he rode upon a cherub and did fly. Yea, he did fly upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place, his pavilion. Round about him were dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. At the brightness that was before him, his thick clouds passed. Hail, stones, coals of fire. The, do the Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the highest gave his voice. Hail, stones, and coals of fire. So again, we're just seeing these little visions that we're getting of the glory of God. Of course, New Testament language, Hebrews 12, 29. Our God is a consuming fire. And our time has consumed itself. <laughs> Don't know where it went, but we didn't get as far as I'd hoped this morning. But may the Lord bless the thoughts we have considered. Amen.